What is a hypothesis? Well, if I had to guess, I guess I would say it's an educated guess. Yeah, well, that definition might have worked for elementary school, but for doing real science, that's naive at best and misleading at worst. It goes along with thinking a theory is just some alternative idea about how the world works that is no better than any other. And theories are much different from hypotheses, although they derive from scientific hypotheses, so... What is a hypothesis? I can't guess. No, you're right. We can't be guessing when dealing with something this important, so let's look it up. Okay, the business dictionary actually gives two pretty good definitions. One, a supposition or explanation that is provisionally accepted in order to interpret certain events or phenomena and to provide guidance for further investigation. A hypothesis may be proven correct or wrong and must be capable of refutation. If it remains unrefuted by facts, it is said to be verified or corroborated. Uh-huh. That goes along with what we have been discussing during the first two weeks of class. It goes along with Karl Popper's notion of falsifiability. For a hypothesis to be good, you have to be able to show where it is bad. And, at the end of the day, or the year, or your life, all you can say is that it has been unrefuted by facts so far undefeated. Eventually, if it keeps winning, like a prize fighter, and becomes the champ, it moves to theory status. But it is unlikely to be an eternally undefeated champion, no matter how strong. The second definition comes from statistics, an assumption about certain characteristics of a population. If it specifies values for every parameter of a population, it's called a simple hypothesis. If not, a composite hypothesis. If it attempts to nullify the difference between two sample means by suggesting that the difference is of no statistical significance, it is called a null hypothesis. That always confused me, that null hypothesis thing. What is that? The null hypothesis, which we designate as H0, 0 standing for the naught, or null, is the main and most prosaic hypothesis we are actually looking for evidence to support. And then there are alternative hypotheses, the more exciting ones perhaps, the ones that win Nobel Prizes, designated by HA, H1, H2, etc., which are what we as scientists have to explore further if H0, the null hypothesis, can't be supported. And see, that's the thing. To do the best possible science, what we want to do is nullify the difference between our novel, exciting Eureka suppositions of what is going on and the more conventional explanation. The null hypothesis basically is the one that says there's nothing special happening. You mean like, nothing to look at here, folks. Move along. Exactly. What we as scientists are actually trying to prove is that there's no significance to the strange and uncomfortable observations we've been making that seem to upend everything we knew before. It would be like if you saw a whole fleet of UFOs over your city. A non-scientist would say, I hypothesize that those flying objects, while unidentified, are evidence of alien technology. A scientist would float the null hypothesis. Those unidentified flying objects probably are insignificant from the perspective of known physics and terrestrial phenomena. <laughs> My alternative hypotheses are that they could be lightning balls, electromagnetic ionization like the Northern Lights, weather balloons, a hoax created by high school kids, or maybe, just maybe, space aliens. Let me test and try as hard as I can to disprove that they are aliens or anything else that doesn't conform to what we already know. And only if I can't disprove the null hypothesis will I then move on to hypotheses that apart further and further from what we already know. So what you're saying is that scientists don't try to prove their hypotheses, they try to disprove them. Absolutely! Our job is to try and refute the hypotheses we have, particularly the most exciting ones. 
If anything, scientists are trying to prove that what they think may be happening is not happening. Are you saying that, for example, climate change scientists are trying to prove climate change is not happening? Absolutely. Who wants to be predicting the end of the world as we know it? The idea that climate change is not anthropogenic, that climate change is not caused by humans, is the scientists' null hypothesis, not the deniers. The deniers actually have no hypotheses. You might think that climate researchers would make the idea that carbon emissions cause global warming their null hypothesis, but that is not how good scientific research is done. Our null hypothesis is actually that human emissions of greenhouse gases do not cause climate change. Only when the data continuously contradicts this hypothesis do we start leaning toward alternatives. Wow. Listen to what this website says about null hypothesis. Quote, how do you know which hypotheses to put in H0 and which to put in HA? Typically, the null hypothesis says that nothing new is happening. The previous result is the same now as it was before, or the groups have the same average. Their difference is equal to zero. In general, you assume that people's claims are true until proven otherwise. So the question becomes, can you prove otherwise? In other words, can you sow sufficient evidence to reject H0? Whoa. So scientists apply the innocent until proven guilty idea to the things that they research. Well, yes and no. Actually, a hallmark of science, as we mentioned, is that we can't definitively prove anything. But based on the strongest hypotheses, we can and often must act. And that is an ethical choice, complicated by arguments of moral hazard and the question of who is going to pay for all of this. What you have to do in your research projects is clearly define and state your hypothesis. How do we do that? You've heard about the PICO model? Nope. Can't say that I have. PICO is the acronym for Population, Interest, Comparison, and Outcome. Four elements that need to be included whenever you are writing a hypothesis, according to a popular handout on hypothesis writing. Yeah, I read that. The handout states, what is a proper hypothesis? A clear, testable statement written in the present tense that includes practical reasoning. And it gives the following example hypothesis statement, quote, dandelions growing in nitrogen-rich soils for two weeks develop larger leaves than those in nitrogen-poor soils because nitrogen stimulates vegetative growth, end quote. Note that the hypothesis doesn't say developed past tense because the study isn't over. And even though it hasn't been done yet, it doesn't use the future tense. That would be leading the witness if you said will develop. You state the hypothesis in a causal fashion. It is hypothesized that this causes that. A causes B, not caused, not will cause, but within these specific parameters, this time period, that protocol or treatment, this happens, and then you test it. And the handout asks you to use PICO to help formulate what you're saying, including P for population, the specific group or individual the research pertains to. The handout mentions a study of the growth rates of dandelions. I for interest, the main concern of the study, in the handout it is effects of nitrogen-rich soils on plant growth. C for comparison, the main alternative group to the group of interest. In the handout, it is dandelions growing in nitrogen-poor soils. O for outcome, what result is expected. In the dandelion study, it would be larger leaves. And T for time, the length of the experiment. In the handout's case, two weeks. Ah, this is the general hypothesis. For testing, you want to create a null hypothesis and at least one alternative hypothesis. In the dandelion case, your H0 is that dandelions growing in nitrogen-rich soils for two weeks do not develop larger leaves than those in nitrogen-poor soils because nitrogen stimulates vegetative growth. In other words, 
you nullify your E, your expectation, and try to demonstrate no growth. Wow, I guess that keeps people honest if they are hell-bent on showing that their hunch, their brilliant idea, actually fails instead of being tempted to fudge the data or skew their observations to demonstrate success. I guess that's the difference between the for-profit applied research done by corporations like pharmaceutical companies and the basic research done by government and academic scientists. Yeah, the temptations are always there. So science tries to protect itself through trying to prove the null hypothesis. And when you construct your hypotheses, they also take stock of parameters, populations, and variables, and clearly define them. Parameters are the unknown quantities whose values you are studying. The proportion, for example, of dandelion leaves, the change in size, for example, or the number of measurements that show a given amount of sea level rise or global average temperature change. Size of leaves or sea level rise or temperature are variables. Note that the hypotheses shouldn't really talk about the variables so much as the parameters affecting the variables and their linkages. In science, we deal with magnitudes of change in variables and proportions that can be statistically analyzed. We can't say with any test that, for example, the climate is changing. That conclusion is an inference drawn from the data. But we can say that a certain proportion of the parameters affecting the variables in the population we are studying are undergoing changes of a certain magnitude that statistically correlates with certain activities suspected of having a causal influence. That's as good as it gets. And then we take those conclusions and present them, and maybe some will try to argue for some policy or practice change, but all the while we continue to support more testing and encourage replication of our results by others until we get, for example, 97% of all scientists reporting their studies to agree with the inference. Wow, yeah. To reiterate, as the website on how to set up a hypothesis tells us, quote, typically in a hypothesis test, the claim being made is about a population parameter, one number that characterizes the entire population. Because parameters tend to be unknown quantities, everyone wants to make claims about what their values may be. They say, to help illustrate, Quote, for example, the claim that 25% of all women have varicose veins is a claim about the proportion, that's the parameter, of all women, that's the population, who have varicose veins, that's the variable, having or not having varicose veins. Whether that parameter goes up or down, and whether it's caused by or affected by high-heeled shoes or not, is a question for good experimental design. Sometimes, if you are studying big unknowns with high-stakes implications, like climate change and ways to mitigate it, it helps to first get a handle on creating and stating a hypothesis about something that is easier to conceive. The possible effect of shoes on varicose veins or of nitrogen on dandelions that are used in the examples may not be your area of interest, and may not seem all that important when you are trying to save the world. Working on your skills in the hypothesis writing using something you don't have a passion for actually can work to your benefit, because science, as done by passionate people, needs to be done dispassionately. If you first write your hypothesis based on something more or less trivial that may help you more easily see the possible flaws in your pet hypothesis formation. You can send rework the language, keeping the PICO structure, keeping clear about parameters, populations, and variables, keeping the tense in the present, and identifying from the outset what is the null hypothesis and what are your alternative hypotheses. But to be a good scientist, you must divorce yourself from the idea that you should be out to prove the thing you know you really started this study to prove. With that discipline, then you massage a good but dispassionate hypothesis structure onto your area of interest, you may be able to do good, disinterested science. And who knows, maybe the null hypothesis is wrong, and your educated guess turned out to be right after all, by which may mean stronger. In that case, keep testing. You may end up with a Nobel Prize, and you may end up saving the world after all. Ha, 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 ha.